The Indianapolis John Doe, 1993, identified as Alan Lee Livingston. Alan Lee Livingston was 27 and living in downtown Indianapolis. He had a family who loved him and missed him, and when they reported him missing, they would state he disappeared on August 6, 1993. They never gave up looking for him. In the early 1990s, the Marion County Sheriff's Office began investigating the cases of gay men going missing in the Indianapolis area. The men were pretty much of similar age, height, and weight. In 1992, one year before Alan went missing himself, a man identifying his name as Brian Smart would contact the Marion County Sheriff, saying he believed someone he often saw out in the bars took the life of a good friend of his, Roger Goodlett, who was currently missing. The man he was suspicious of said a lot of suspicious things about Roger, trying to figure out if anything was known about his case. However, he wasn't able to identify who the man was, and he also didn't give his real name. It turns out that Brian Smart was actually Tony Harris. More and more men in this area would go missing, but the families of Roger Goodlett and another man, Alan Wayne Roussard, would contact an investigator named Vandegriff, who had previously worked as a policeman, and it was he who would break the case wide open. He would send investigators to drinking establishments in the area that gay men were known to go to, that were known as pickup areas. And in fact, both of the men who'd gone missing had gone to this establishment. And others they believed to be related had gone missing from there also. The more they looked into it, it seemed that more and more men were missing than they even knew about. What his investigators learned was pretty alarming. Eventually, he was in contact with a man who reported a disturbing event that had happened to him and that man thought it might be related to the missing men. He had gone home from the bar to a really fancy house on the outside of Indianapolis. The man who had picked him up would say that he was a groundskeeper for this home. The two drank and took what I'll describe as illicit substances, and the man who had given his name as Herb took a hose and wrapped it around his neck. He would say he was terrified and he pretended to pass out. Eventually, the man realized that he was only faking it, but rather than repeat the event, he drove the man back into town. It doesn't appear he ever reported that event to the police, but it's important to remember that back then, when it came to same-sex crimes, there was fear of how it would be received by those who know them or how it would be received by the police. That doesn't mean the Indiana police would have ignored his report, but it's just important to say there were a lot of factors that probably went into him not reporting. The man he did this to, who had gotten away, would say that he never forgot what happened and he had watched for the man who had done this to him. And he would actually run into him again in another bar in the city. He jumped up on a table, screamed out that this guy was a serial <laughs> while pointing at him and yelling to get his license number. And someone did. They went and got his license number. It would be reported to the police and they would discover the car was licensed to a man named Herbert Baumeister. He had actually given his real first name. And he wasn't a groundskeeper to that home, however, but he was a wealthy businessman who lived with his wife on an 18-acre property in Westfield, Indiana. It was August of 1995 when the police got the report about Baumeister, but so far there was just an allegation and no proof. They needed to get a search warrant or something along those lines in order to find more information, but judges in Hamilton County determined the informant was not credible enough as a witness to grant a search warrant. It may have been complicated by the fact that Baumeister was pretty wealthy and he owned two Save-A-Lot thrift stores in Indianapolis. Although they couldn't search, he was interviewed and he claimed to the detective that he wasn't ever part of a bar scene. But of course they know his vehicle was at one of the bars in question. He then told police he was embarrassed and lied, not because he hurt anyone but because his family didn't know about his activities. They did request to do a search on the property but he refused, as did his wife. For a while, he was able to convince her that he was being unfairly targeted. They used aerial infrared to try to look down on the property to see if they could see anything, but they could not. And then her Baumeister's wife began questioning him about what was going on, and everything began falling apart. Their business was struggling, and their home was nearing foreclosure. She came forward to her attorney and shared with him that in early 1985, their son had actually found a skull and other bones on the property, and she had showed her husband where they were found. He told her the remains belonged to his father, and they were used for dissection and medical studies. 
She believed him, and Baumeister just told her he'd dispose of them somewhere else. And when his wife checked, they were gone. The attorney was bound by confidentiality, but strongly hinted to the police that they should keep looking. Herb Baumeister and his wife separated, and things just kept getting worse. In June of 1996, Baumeister's behavior got more and more erratic, and his wife became concerned for their kids. He closed one of their stores and grabbed his son and took him on an unplanned trip to a nearby lake that the wife and the kids used to go to frequently. The weird thing is, though, that Herb rarely went with them, instead staying behind, saying he needed to care for the store. Although, in retrospect, it was probably time for him to be able to go out and do what he wanted to do in the bars, rather than being with his family. So while he was gone with the kids, his wife would suddenly realize that he had drained their joint accounts. They were totally emptied. She feared he wasn't mentally stable, and she was concerned for her children. So it was at this point that she reversed herself and let the police search. As they walked the area where the children found the bones, the police would realize that there were bone fragments everywhere, all over the ground. Hundreds and hundreds of bones and teeth were found. So as the search was on, a judge forced Baumeister to hand over his son, saying they were afraid he would learn of the search and hurt the boy. However, this was in a different jurisdiction, and while they grabbed the boy, they did not arrest the man, even though they knew at this point that there were bones all over the property. Baumeister was now on the run, making his way to Canada while authorities were pretty close to the point where they would arrest him. As they closed in, he used an item starting with a G and ending with an N to escape paying for what he did to all those men, perishing from a wound to his head in Pinery Provincial Park in Canada on July 3, 1996. He even left a note, but infuriatingly enough, he did not bother to explain what was found on his property. Instead of giving closure to any of those people whose families are now grieving and suffering, he simply blamed his failing marriages and businesses for the act that he was going to take. The note was three pages written on yellow note paper, and he apologized for messing up the park, for his marriage and his business failings. Yet he admitted to no crimes at all, although he did say this was the second location he meant to do it in. He had gone to the first location to take his own life, and there were children there, so he changed his mind. In 1999, they were able to assemble the remains of eight men found on his property. Two missing men, Broussard and Goodlett, were finally going home to their family. His wife would further explain the mystery of the monster she married, saying they were married for 25 years and were only intimate six times, and that her marriage wasn't great. He claimed he was embarrassed by how thin he was, and that was his reason for avoiding marital relations. From the outside, people thought everything was okay in the family, but it wasn't. Our John Doe in this case went unidentified with three others who were found. That is, until Jeff Jellison was elected coroner in 2022. Jellison has made it his mission to try to identify the unidentified men who are still waiting. It was then that a new search of the property was ordered in December of 2022. They originally found eight men, but the new search identified 20 possible new locations as well as more bone fragments. The remains of 11 people have been found so far, with only eight identified. The identified men deserve recognition, too, so here they are as follows. Johnny Lee Bayer, known to his friends as Johnny, he was just 20 when he went missing on May 28, 1993, in Indianapolis. Jeffrey Allen Jones, known to his family as Jeff, was 31 when he went missing on July 6, 1993. Richard Douglas Hamilton Jr. was 20 when he went missing on July 31, 1993. Manuel Resendez was a children's counselor from Lafayette, Indiana, when the 31-year-old man was last seen at a downtown Indianapolis bar on August 6, 1993. I should mention, too, that our John Doe went missing on that same date, August 6, 1993, although it's not clear if they were all together at the same time. Stephen Sperlin Hale was 28 when he went missing on April 1, 1994. Alan Wayne Broussard was 28 when he went missing on July 6, 1994. Roger Allen Goodlett was just a little older, 33, when he went missing on July 22, 1994. Roger was last seen after he left his mother's residence where he lived to visit the same local bar where others had gone missing from in Indianapolis. In fact, two weeks before Roger disappeared, 
he was seen in the company of Herr Baumeister. The last identification I want to mention now is the last man known to have gone missing. From those identified, that is Michael Frederick Kiern, known to his friends as Mike. He was the oldest of the men whose remains were found. He was last seen on March 31, 1995, in downtown Indianapolis. A jacket belonging to Mike was found inside of Baumeister's residence. The disturbing thing, too, is that there were other missing men from that area at that time. I'll mention it again later, but it's super important for anyone to have gone missing from that area to have a family member come forward and offer their DNA to the police. They're going to still be testing more of the remains that were found. A big change came about with this case with the newly elected coroner, as I mentioned, Jeff Jellison, and he has really been pushing these cases. He would say he's making it his goal to use new DNA technology to identify the men, starting with today's John Doe. He didn't stop there, though. He would announce a new search on the property, including the release of the remains of Michael Kern, so his family can finally lay him to rest. They've had a marked plot for him for several decades in hopes his remains would be released. The city was still holding on to them even though he'd been identified on June 15, 1999. I think it's natural to have questions, too, not just about who the missing men are still on that property, as well as the particular monster who did what he did. If I had to guess in this case, I would think maybe his need for a male partner caused him embarrassment, and so he lived basically a fake life doing the things that he felt he wanted to do in private. Of course, none of those things make you cruel. In the 1990s, it was still pretty normal for people to hide their orientation in order to avoid judgment of others. In this case, it seems like maybe hiding in the shadows sort of allowed him to hone his desires to hurt others. So maybe it was a game to Herbert Baumeister, and maybe it's even true that the first time was an accident. But this was not some sort of accidental repeat event. The authorities have since publicly linked the disappearance of Jerry Williams Comer. Comer was 34 when he was last seen in Indianapolis on August 8, 1995. His car was found at Castleton Square Mall. There was some suggestion that Baumeister was perhaps trying to recreate the first time he took someone's life with all of the others. What's sort of interesting about this, too, is that usually they seem to be preying on people who are on the street that won't be missed, but these men weren't hiding. They had families who loved them and weren't surprised by their orientation. They weren't at a higher risk because they were isolated from family. And maybe that, thankfully, in part, led to his downfall. There's a very real possibility that there's a lot more men out there on that horse farm. So far, there have been over 10,000 teeth and bones recovered, and they are starting the very expensive and time-consuming process of trying to identify all of these tiny little bits and pieces. Many of the bones were burned, and of course he had broken them apart. Jellison has made it clear that the case is important to him, and more identifications will happen, so family members who think their loved one might be in these remains are asked to call him at 317-770-4415. Because Jellison had talked about this case before and wanting to identify them, Alan Livingston's mother saw it on the news and came forward and begged him to check to see if her son was in those remains. It turns out Sharon Livingston has terminal cancer and she got the help of Alan's cousin to send her DNA to the authorities in hopes of finding a match before her battle was over. So out of those 10,000 fragments, they chose 40 to be processed for DNA because of the cost. And those were compared to Sharon's DNA that she donated. Sharon would wait along with her nephew, Eric Pranger, hoping that they might finally find Alan. And shockingly, one out of those samples was Alan Livingston. The odds were pretty much against that ever happening. Her nephew would say that he's happy Sharon got some closure, but he's sad because they got confirmation that it's Alan, saying, we were all just hoping Alan was out there alive somewhere, but he's not. And truly, that is the limbo that these families live in. They sit there wanting the knowledge, and they can't help but hoping they're wrong, but at the same time, they want to know. What further complicates things is those remains in the property weren't the only ones found to believe to be caused by Baumeister. Other men who were partially clothed were found somewhere else in shallow water in central Indiana and Ohio around the time that he's believed to have been targeting men. Police have suspected Baumeister of being the I-70 Strangler, who was active between 1980 and 1981, 
targeting 19 young men who were the victims of SA and then dumped near Interstate 70 in Indiana and Ohio. Most of these in that case were part of the LGBTQ community who had disappeared within a four block radius in Indianapolis. So they were very linked to each other. I look forward to being able to cover more of these identifications in the future. I can't find follow-ups as to any more searching that was done after they identified the 20 possible spots that they thought remains could be in, so it's possible there's even more. The person who owns the horse farm now has been very accommodating and respectful of what's happened. He says he's very aware and mindful of what might be out in the woods behind his home. Alan Lee Livingston is the ninth victim so far, but Jellison reports that they feel they could have as many as 25 people in the end who will be identified. More than 30 families so far have provided DNA and are waiting results. Jellison has been open about how thankful he is that Alan's remains were the first to be identified. The odds of being able to give Sharon Livingston an answer before she passed should have been nearly impossible, but it happened. I wish I could tell you more about Alan, but the truth is I don't know a lot about his life. What I know is that his family loved him, and they missed him, and they never forgot him. Alan Lee Livingston was missing for 33 years. He was an unidentified John Doe for 30. Had he lived the life he deserved, he would be 57 years old today. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end, and a big thanks to all of you who consistently like and comment on the videos. The whole dance with YouTube is hard sometimes. Whether you leave a full comment or an emoji, it makes a huge difference. It's a huge push toward the videos being suggested to new people. The next goal is 20,000. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.